Starting at 12 o'clock. Okay, that's an issue. What's going on everybody? Welcome back to another episode here at The Stable. Previously on the channel, we did a budget rebuild on the 302 for the Scrap Stang. And for those of you that are new here, that's the Scrap Stang. And it holds the name Scrap Stang because it is built from a plethora of scrap parts. The engine is out of a Mercury Mountaineer. Transmission is out of a Fox Body Mustang. And rear diff is out of a Ford Explorer. And if you guys haven't noticed yet, we have one more edition of scrap parts. A car's gotta have a seat, right? Not brackets yet, but we now have a proper bucket seat for the scrap staying. Nothing special, just a regular bucket seat by uh, Scat or Procar. But it was a Facebook Marketplace find I could not resist for a hundred bucks. I mean, it holds me in, does the job, I'll call it a win. We do have to fabricate some seat brackets in order to properly bolt it on. So uh, stay tuned for that. Anyway, today we have to continue the reassembly on our 5 liter 302. And we do have some cool parts for it that I am excited to install. But before we get into that, We've got some mail to unbox. This one is specifically from one of my Instagram buddies, Michael. So shout out to him. Let's see what we got. God. <laughs> We got a crap ton of earplugs, but he made a really good point in these are very useful for when you have holes that you want to block off. Like in the last video, we were stuffing paper towels into these oil galleys so we wouldn't get any trash into them. So thank you. Shout out to the homie Michael. Next up, a package from our friend Rick, who has a pretty cool last name. Sounds Italian and I'm not going to try to pronounce it. Stick and rudder. Holy crap. Nice. Blue skies and tailwinds, nice. Huge thanks to Rick because I'm definitely going to dive into this book and hopefully I'll come out a better pilot. For those of you who don't know, we have started posting more aviation content on the channel. So if you're interested, go check that out. Anyway, let me show you guys the new parts that we have for the 302. There's a lot of opinions about these where we should use them or we should not use them, but I bought them and I'll tell you why. That is a set of ARP head studs. These head studs are meant to replace the traditional head bolt. There is pros and cons on either option that you go with. For example, a con of the traditional head bolt is that once they are torqued to spec, they cannot be reused again. Head studs, however, on the other hand, are reusable. Head studs are typically used in high horsepower or boosted applications. Some people might say that head studs are overkill for our application and you'd be right. I mean, if we're lucky, we might be pushing around 250 to the wheel. So I definitely wouldn't consider this a high horsepower or high compression application, but I didn't buy these because we're going to be pushing a whole lot of horsepower. I got them because they were 80 bucks on Facebook Marketplace. And now if we ever open up this engine again, we don't have to buy head bolts. So it already outweighs the cost. So technically we are saving money or at least that's what I tell my wife. I'm also putting a bit of thread sealant on these lower ones because these bolts right here go into the water jackets for the coolant. It is also recommended to use a fastener assembly lube for this, which is different from the engine assembly lube we used in the last video. So our head studs are now installed on the passenger side, not much to it. Another reason why people might not like using head studs uh, compared to head bolts is because the head gasket and the head bolt are an engineered fail point, meaning that if there's something wrong with the engine, that head gasket or head bolt will fail in order to protect something else from failing. And with the improved clamping force of the head studs, we in a way take away that engineered failing point, which could be a bad thing because, not saying that we can't blow a head gasket because it's definitely possible. If we take away the engineered failure point, then the engine will assign a new failure point. But I'm not too worried about that because like I said, this engine is not pushing much power. Maybe if we were pushing around 300 to 400 horsepower, which is pretty much the limits of this block, then I'd be worried. We'd be lucky to get 250. Like I said, we're not installing these because we're gonna be making a ton of power. We're just installing them so we don't have to keep on buying head bolts. And because the Catman and Robert Lugo helped us out with this, now you guys are forever stuck in this block. Now we slip on our head gasket, making sure it's facing the right way. If not, we are gonna have some cooling issues. And of course, I forget he's spaghetti to clean the head. So let's do that now. The cylinder head doesn't need much, mainly scraping off 
the head gasket material. We could do that easy peasy with a fresh razor blade. Plugging up the uh, coolant passages with some paper towels. These are too big to use the earplugs on. Cool, now that we got the bulk of the uh, head gasket material off, now we can start pulling out the paper towels with some needle nose pliers, Knipix of course. Now we can give it a quick. Now we're gonna give the head surface the same treatment that we did the block deck, which is 400 grit with a sanding block. And for those of you at home freaking out that I just did that, the sanding block with the 400 grit in no way is considered resurfacing this block. It is not to remove any material from the cast iron of the block. It is just to remove the surface imperfections, like the little bit of gasket that I couldn't remove. Anyway, we're just gonna give it a quick. And this would be a perfect time to check the straightness of this head. And you can do that by getting a good straight edge and a feeler gauge, but I don't have a good straight edge or that thin of a feeler gauge set. So we're just gonna run it. The previous head gasket was not leaking and it had no signs of damage. So I'm going to assume it's okay. And if you're wondering why we don't just take it to a machine shop, go watch the last three videos and you'll get the answer. Carefully going to place this two ton piece of metal Oh God. Oh. God. I'm going to remove this head because I think I need to install all the lifters first because these little guards go like right here. And I think the cylinder head is going to get in the way um, if it's installed first. I know some assemblies don't have these. They just have this like dog bone um, to them. So you can install those with the cylinder head on. I'm not too sure about these ones. I could be wrong, but I'd rather be safe than sorry. Starting off with the cam install, just going to put some assembly lube um, where the bearing rides. You know what? Why not get crazy with it? Put it all over the place. Yes, it would have been easier to install the cam without the crankshaft installed, but I'm an idiot and I installed the crank and all the rods and the pistons. And then I remembered it would have been easier. Oh, also some people were concerned that I didn't check the end play on the crankshaft. Well, I don't have a dial indicator, so that's why it did not get done. Nice. Going to rotato potato the crank so we can get our timing set. And the good thing about not having the cylinder heads installed is you know when you're at top dead center because you can see the piston. I'm going to torque these down to 10 foot pounds. Now for the timing set. And to make my life easier, I have not separated these. They are going back exactly on the way they came off. Our timing chain. Mm, not as tight as I would like it to be, but it's not loose enough to say it needs immediate replacement. Cam bolt is getting 40 foot pounds. There we go. Our timing dots are in line. So I started cleaning up the lifters and their retainers just to give you an idea of how dirty they were. So this is the one that I just cleaned. Compared to this one that I have not cleaned yet, you could hear and even see all the grittiness there is to it. With all of the lifters cleaned up, I'm just going to place a dab of the assembly loop on the roller. We already have some on the cam, so it's not that necessary, but just in case. Then I'm going to generously apply some oil. Some people like to leave these soaking inside a Petri dish or a Tupperware with oil for a while, but I don't want to do that because that'll mess with the accuracy when we are trying to set our valve lash or our preload. We will ensure that everything is properly oiled by priming the system uh, before the first start. With our lifters now installed, we can slip on the retainer. Well, now we just have to rinse and repeat. With the lifters now installed and lubed up, we can install this retainer or spider, whatever it's called, back to the cylinder head. Oh God, I 
that's heavy. Yeah, I don't know if I could have slid on these retainers with the head installed, but I'm glad we did it before. Oh God. I've already gone ahead and cleaned up the other head. Oh my, it's slipping. Okay, one of the things about head studs is it makes it a little bit harder to throw on your head. All right, both heads are now installed. It's looking more like an engine. Before we start torquing down the heads though, there's a couple things we need to do. We need to lubricate the threads as well as the seat where the nut is going to be resting. The best way to do that is to use the ARP fastener loop that would have came with these when they were new. But since we got these pre-owned, we don't have any. So we're just gonna use a little bit of oil. It should be, should be good enough. And we're just going to seat them down. I just got this tool at a yard sale like 30 minutes ago. I saw it and I was like, I gotta have it. Makes me feel like a old hot rodder. I'm not torquing these down at all. I'm just making them seat. So then we could hit them with the torque wrench. Today, we're gonna be using the Anpuds torque wrench. The regular head bolts would get torqued down to 70 foot pounds, whereas the ARP head studs have to go up to 80 foot pounds. We're gonna do this in three stages. We're gonna go up to 50, then 65, and then 80. Following the proper torque sequence, starting with the middle, 50 foot pounds. That has a nice audible click. Round of 50 is done. Let's move to 65. And our final rating of 80. All right, so all of our head studs on this side are now torqued to spec, but I realized I didn't explain why we have to lubricate these. So the reason that the threads as well as the nut seat have to be lubricated is in order to get a proper torque reading. Because with the increased friction, you might have some inconsistencies while torquing it down, say if you um, installed them dry, but with them being lubricated, it makes the torquing down sequence a lot more consistent, if that makes sense. And like I said, the best lubricant to use on there is the ARP uh, fast fastener assembly lube, but we only have our little oil can right now, so it's gonna have to do. And obviously I'm not soaking them where they are completely drenched. The threads just need a light coat of oil. I guess it's like those food recipes that tell you it's uh, salt to taste. This thing is squeaking too much. I think this thing could use a little bit of oil too. Would you look at that? No more squeaking. You guys hear that? That is not the torque wrench. That is the sound of the friction that is uh, coming into play here. That is a great example on why you should lube the threads when torquing these down. Obviously the ARP um, fastener assembly lube is the best you can use, but it is what it is. Now we can install our valve train, but before we do that, I wanted to show you guys how the rocker assembly works because I found it pretty interesting myself. So obviously these are the rocker arms for the engine, but this is an exploded view of the assemblies. Starting off, we have some shims for the valve adjustment, then this seat where the uh, rocker arm will sit and float on. And then inside the rocker arm, we have this little pivot guy that uh, obviously just pivots in there. And then we have the bolt that goes through. I just found it interesting how there was so many components to the rocker arms themselves. While I clean these rocker arms up, I'm gonna go on a little rant. So if you're here strictly for the engine content, you could go ahead and skip to this timestamp, but it's a bit of a sad day here at the stable because I think we're gonna have to let go of our daily, which is the GTI. Going full time with YouTube and putting my 100% effort into these videos as well as growing the channel has come with a significant pay cut that is just starting to catch up with me. I'm working as fast as I can, six, seven days out of the week in order to make these videos as well as to pay the bills. So it's not like I have any extra time to just go pick up a shift at a local auto parts store because then we would have to decrease the frequency of these videos. So if we can't just go get another job, then we have to limit our expenses. And obviously the first thing to go is the GTI, which really sucks because this is 100% the best car I've ever had. But I am fully committed to this channel and to you guys that watch these videos. 
So if that's what we have to do, then that's what we'll do. This cleaner is doing something very weird to these gloves. They were not this big when I started. Anyway, we'd obviously have to find another daily that will lower our month to month cost of living. But yeah, that's the rant of the day. And for those of you that stuck through this part, you are the factor that makes this all worth it. So thank you. Cool, our rocker assemblies are now clean. You can see all the crud and schmoo that was on them. Before I install them, I'm going to lube up these, uh, this pivot ball right here, because once it is installed, it's gonna be a bit harder to do so. And some of you might think this is overkill for an engine that's pretty worn already, but overkill seems to be the theme today, so. All right, with all those pins now looped up, we're just going to continue to add assembly loop to everything that will need it like both ends of the push rod are a good place to lube up it's good to have this lubrication but you definitely don't want to add too much of it because you might clog up the oil holes because this stuff is super thick and we have the shims in place exactly how they came off and we can set our preload once all of them are installed so let's continue with the rest of them All right, all of our rocker assemblies and push rods are now installed. We can now start setting up our valve lash, preload, valve torque, whatever you wanna call it. To do this, we wanna verify we are at top dead center, but we know we are because we just rebuilt the damn engine and we visually saw our piston at top dead center. Both of our valves are closed. First step is we want to set this assembly at zero lash. So what that means is this push rod has no play um, with this uh, rocker arm. We don't want any gap between them and we also don't want them to be pushed up against each other. So just touching. And the way we do that is I like to push it up and down. A lot of people say um, where it doesn't spin anymore. I don't like to do that. So right here, you can hear it has play. We're going to tighten down our nut till we don't hear or feel that up and down movement anymore. Still have a little bit. All right, that is zero lash right there. Now we repeat that step for the second valve. As you can see, we have a lot of up and down movement. So the valves are now at zero lash. Now what? We have our torque wrench set to 20 foot pounds, but we have to achieve that 20 foot pounds within a quarter to a full turn. And if we don't do that, then we have to adjust the shims. We're gonna start at our 12 o'clock position. That's a quarter turn. Okay, so just a little bit over a quarter turn. That one is good. Starting at 12 o'clock once again. Quarter turn. So our cylinder number one is now set and adjusted. You would think that you could just move on to the cylinder next door, but you have to follow the firing order, which in this engine is one, three, seven, two, six, five, four, and eight. And no, I'm not that smart to just remember that. I'm reading it off of my phone right here. So next up is cylinder number three. And before we can start on cylinder number three, we have to make sure that it is at top dead center. Previously, number one was at top dead center and to get three to top dead center, it is pretty easy. All we have to do is to rotate the crank 90 degrees. So we're at 12 o'clock. That's 90 degrees right there. And now our cylinder number three is at top dead center. Once again, looking for zero lash. All right, so let's put the torque wrench to it and see what we get. Starting at 12 o'clock. Okay, that's an issue. I'm going to try this one, see what we get. Starting at 12 o'clock. Okay, so both of these valves are way too tight. It hit 20 foot pounds before even hitting a quarter turn and that is a no-go. So we're gonna remove one of the shims on each one of these rockers. All right, so here are the rockers that we removed and we're just going to take off one shim off of each one and then double check our reading. Back on they go. 
I've already set these to zero lash. So now let's just do the spin test starting at 12. Okay, a little bit under half. Okay, cool, same thing. Okay, so that was pretty interesting. Luckily, it was an easy fix. Removing one shim from each one gave us the clearance that we needed. I believe one of those shims um, equals to about a quarter turn, so we're good. Next up, cylinder number seven, so that means another 90 degree turn or quarter turn. Sitting at zero lash, starting at 12 o'clock. Okay, same thing clicking before a quarter turn. It's kind of weird because that's exactly how they came off of the engine. So that's the way that it was set up before. Either they set them up wrong or I mixed and matched the shims, which I don't believe I did because I kept a good track of them. But it looks like we're gonna have to remove one shim from each one again. All right, let's try this again. Sitting at 12 o'clock. Okay, a little bit under half turn. Same thing, nice. Next up, cylinder number two. Another 90 degree turn, starting at 12. Wow. Okay, so we're at three quarters of a turn. That was quite a bit. And this one just over a quarter turn. Huh, it's getting a little weird here. This one needs a shim added. Well, this one needs a shim removed. Let's try that again. Starting at 12 o'clock. Okay, clicked over half a turn. And just under half a turn. I'm starting to think none of these were set properly. I mean, I'm not a professional engine builder, right? But come on. All right, all of our valves are now adjusted, preloaded, good to go. I ended up removing a total of six shims. I also messed around with them by taking out two at a time or adding two and seeing what it does. But once again, all of them are adjusted and good to go. Also regarding the merch with the Patreon names on it, I know we said that we were working on it, but we got set back a bit on time with the engine rebuild, but we are now back on track. I need to get this car ready for the photo shoot um, in order for us to render the design onto a t-shirt. So if you want your name on that t-shirt, um, as well as the scraps thing right here, here's the link. Also, we are planning to attend the Good Guys Autocross up in Phoenix next week. So make sure you guys have your notifications on so you don't miss that video. So we now have the long block assembly complete. We are now back on track to get the scraps thing running for this summer. Drop a like if you're as excited as I am. With that being said, thank you guys for watching and I will see you on the next one.